welcome to the Industry Angel Podcast. We hear from the best business minds across the globe, entrepreneurs, social influencers, marketing mavens, and sales rock stars. We've got them all. Here comes your weekly dose of inspiration with your host, Ian Farah. Welcome to episode 198. Eight? Is that right? Yeah, it's eight. it'll do. Welcome to <laughs> Welcome to episode 198 of the Industry Angel. Hello my friends, it's been too long. I hope you and yours are safe and well. Thank you to those who've dropped me a message recently. You know I love them. I try to get to each one. If I've missed your note, please forward it again or retweet it um, as my notifications just go crazy, as does the inbox. Um, best place, I guess, is Twitter, industry underscore angel, or the website, industryangel.com. Um, I love to connect on LinkedIn too, as you know. Uh, we've been playing with stories this week on LinkedIn, and we've had a lot of fun because we love it when new functionality comes out here at Far North because we get to test it, and then we can tell our clients about it and hopefully help raise their profiles. I hope you enjoyed the live stream we did recently. As you know, we've been chopping up the episodes, and uh, this episode will be going out as a live stream as well. So if you don't make it, remember the videos are there on the social channels, so you can watch back again later. I know some of you like to see what the guest looks like and stuff like that, so jump on YouTube, Facebook, they'll be there. As I speak to you, it's the 30th of October, now, not only is that my daughter's birthday, which means my wallet is considerably lighter, but it also means it's Halloween tomorrow. Where on earth has this year gone? The Christmas decorations are in the shops, I noticed yesterday. So, you know, this few past few months for us, it's just been so, so busy at Far North. And it's been really rewarding as well, because we've been helping clients, uh, their businesses recover uh, during this year, but I'm looking forward to December. I know I'm saying that, and it's not even November yet, but we've got a really busy November coming up. So in December, I've just decided that we're going to kick back a little bit and just ease off the pedal because it's been so hectic, and you know I'm mindful about burnout. You know what I'm like. You know I keep saying yes to everything and get overwhelmed with stuff. So I'm looking forward to coming off the gas soon. I hope you guys are too. I hope you're not pushing too hard to try to recoup anything that you might have lost during lockdown. So we're now approaching episode 200 and we celebrated that recently with with our last live. So I'm grateful for all the well wishes and gifts, especially Team D who spoiled us with some fantastic champagne. Far too kind. But yes, I'm proud. I'm proud we've hit 200. That was never a goal, but we've just had so much fun across these five years or so. So, And that's down to you. That's down to you sharing the show with your friends, you know, telling people about it, referring us on, just saying, hey, you know, why don't you subscribe to this? There's some good content. Hopefully you say that. So uh, that, would, that would help us. So, you know, please refer us on. There's your homework. Refer us on. One or two today. So, yeah, 200. Great feet. Really pleased with that. Okay, remember, keep in touch with me. I love to hear what you guys have been up to. And let's hear from today's guest. Back, we are back, we are live. I hope you can hear me okay. So we are live across Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. I hope you enjoyed our last live. I think we had three or four guests on. Been some great feedback on that. Just remember, we had um, Annika Hicks talking about Excluded UK and uh, I nearly lost my, <laughs> um, well, it's so emotive, isn't it? You know, and if you haven't seen Excluded UK, you know, jump on and, and see what they're doing from a business point of view. There's 3 million forgotten business owners that have fell through the cracks of Rishi's uh, support. So we've been doing a lot of work on LinkedIn and on our social channels to try to raise that cause. So thanks for all your support. I know you've been helping, especially you, Peter. Uh, thanks so much for jumping on this morning and sharing all our stuff on LinkedIn and comments. It's a really important topic from a business point of view. And speaking of a business point of view, our guest today is going to blow my mind, okay? Blockchain, digital strategies, 
just it's it's totally my bag isn't it so <laughs> i'm uh, i'm looking forward to this so you can see me squirm for the next half hour and pretend that i know what i'm talking about but you know that that's the that's the beauty of being a presenter isn't it you just gotta think on your feet right then i think we should bring her in because i can see her in the green room smiling away so let's hear from today's guest digital strategist can we say our kate Beaucherelle. <laughs> I've oh, been no. laughing my head off here, Ian. I really have. <laughs> Happy Friday, sister. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? <laughs> well, just like we had a quick brief talk before, it's Friday. We're feeling good. You know, it's yeah. been half term. You're not being stressed at all, have you? Uh, no, I planned the entire week of doing, you know, crafts and um, uh, walks in the countryside. No, no, I ended up catching up on all of my work. I still haven't yeah. finished the filing. Loads of stuff happened. Uh, yeah, it's, um, but it's, it's been, yeah, it's been a little bit of a different week, which is nice. I started the week with pink hair and it, it, it's just still very slightly at the edges, but. <sighs> pink hair? What, what happened there? Uh, I declared half term because uh, I didn't actually have to have to have to be online with anybody until today so <laughs> fantastic I noticed that quite a lot you in lockdown um Terry Max a friend of the show Terry he dyed him his hair purple and he's goatee purple everything and just ah, COVID times why not yeah how old are your children kid uh 12 and 14 Ah, oh, fantastic so one of them's been banned from playing games while we're online because occasionally the bandwidth glitches a bit uh, and the other one's still asleep so you may get an interruption at one point going mom you're talking too loud so the 14 year old's still asleep yes that's how it works isn't it <laughs> <laughs> what, what, you got a couple of boys or girl and a boy G uh, come on what's the girl. names gail and louis Ah, beautiful, beautiful. Oh, well, get them to come in. Get them to come in because this is what we've been doing during the uh, lockdown. We, had, um, we went live. I don't know if you saw it on April Fool's Day. We went live for about nine hours. We had 16 speakers in back to back, which was fantastic. And there was, there was wives just plonking teas down. There was kids running in. But I think, you know, during lockdown, we've we've really shared so much about each other you know yeah with children. we're in your home right now and it's just fantastic isn't it oh yeah the the, the whole culture has completely shifted it's been fantastic it really has it, it's so much more comfortable because i've always worked from home and i was really conscious well not always worked from home but the last few years i've been very much based at home and and i've been really conscious about you know turning everything around so i look professional and so you can't see the washing behind me and stuff and <laughs> uh, and and now it, it's it's just like a lot more relaxed and people are more accepting of the fact that maybe you haven't got your full makeup on this morning and mm. yeah it's good and you've got your pink hair yeah uh, yeah <laughs> but i guess like you i'm really missing network and though I just love hugs and handshakes yes. and selfies and I, I'm, not, yes. I'm not doing too well, Kate. I'm not doing too yeah. well with this. It's a huge thing. miss. It's a mm. huge miss. It really yeah. is. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the last networking event I went to, you were at as well, uh, at Proto, wow. possibly. So yeah. Long. It was the last yeah. networking event I went to. Wowzers. So yeah. But we've been doing all this online and um, you know how things have changed and, you know, talking about innovation, how we adapt. We were solely audio only. And then when the pandemic hit, I thought, right, okay, let's jump on and do stuff like this. So actually we're here because of that. And actually, you know, people commenting, which hopefully, hopefully you can see on the side. Um, yeah. We, this is what we've done and it's worked really well, really, really yeah. well, you know, what? and we can throw things up like this from our friends. So should you have any questions for Kate, you can ask us as we go and I'll throw them up on the screen. Because, I can uh, see them here. So. <laughs> mm, if you've got any crazy questions, please help me out here because this topic, right, this topic could blow my mind. How, I'll, I'll do my best. I, I, I don't know. How did you get into this? So you, you, know, you look at your oh. profile, Kate, and you're like business development. So the same as me, kind of sales, commercial. But then, you're, then you just do like, Blocking. Then I just pivot. Yeah, it was actually it's, it's it was a really uh, it was kind of an or, quite an organic process because actually, believe it or not, I'm an accountant. I spent 20 years behind the calculator and worked my way up through businesses from yeah, sort of FTSE 100 and so on to startups and, and all sorts of things. But all the way through, I was doing tech as well. So I, I actually my first job when I really didn't want to be an accountant, but I had a degree in it and I was being pushed to go and 
qualified. I went off and I worked in America for a software company. And uh, so I came back and I was the only person in the company at the time who knew how to work this brand new computer that only needed a small room to fit in, <laughs> how that actually worked and how to do the reports. So I always ended up doing the software side of the business as well. So in the big firms, I was working with the tech people to improve reporting. In the smaller firms, I was running the small business server, I was running the Linux box, I was installing software, I was all sorts of stuff. So when I finally, my last CFO role, I got um, made redundant in 2010. And there was no work around. It was it was the right the aftermath of the financial crash. It was horrendous. I had two small children, preschool age children. Um, all of our parents were in there. So you know, all, all the generation above us were falling ill. We were dealing with care homes. Couldn't work, and ended up just starting a tech business as you do. In 2015, we had um. Uh, a client, a potential client came and said, oh, you know, I want to use your software for this idea I've got. And we spent forever specking this thing out and going, come on, where's the money? Where's the money? Where's the money? And then she went, not going to use your software. I'm going to use Ethereum. And I went, what's Ethereum? <laughs> and it had literally just gone to sandbox stage at that, at that point. And I already knew about Bitcoin. I knew there was something really interesting going on there. And um, I, I, I did. I actually had tiny, tiny quantities. I wish I had a hell of a lot more. And then I started looking into Ethereum. And I went to South by Southwest. I've been five mm. times on the bounce. Have you really? um, yeah, I love it. Uh, this year would have been my sixth, and I was mentoring and all sorts of stuff. I still did the mentoring actually. I did okay. it online with people in like LA and Japan and, and and Lithuania and all sorts. But yeah, so I met all the consensus people early on when they were first developing everything. And because I'm an accountant, I looked and went, "It's a ledger. I understand you record your transactions and you have an audit trail, and actually it's distributed, so everybody's put it." And I just understood it very quickly, and I assumed everyone else did, and then I discovered they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you've dropped a couple of terms there. You've dropped uh, Ethereum and Bitcoin. So these are cryptocurrencies. Yeah. Is this still in development, Kate? You know, you said that you understood it. Is it still a kind of emerging tech in order to change the way these things work? Or is it like, this is how it works, and then let's just mine it? Because that's a term, isn't it, where you mine? Oh, yeah. No, that's so. There's there's a lot of different things going on here. Um, okay. it's, it's, a really, really, it's a really, really, it's a really sort of... Um, take us right the way back then. I'll start right at the very beginning. So the very, very beginning is um, there's cryptographers working in the 70s and 80s, and then there's the, there's there's some fuss going on in in america around cryptography and how it really needs to be used by everybody to protect user licenses on software and so on mm -hmm. uh, and at the time it was actually classed as a, a military a military tool because it was being used in obviously for encrypting code and stuff so there was this movement grew up the cypherpunks and the, the crypto anarchists saying you know we need cryptography to be open to everybody and they succeeded in doing this but this crypto anarchist group said you know if everything fell we'd still need money how do you do money without a government how do you do money without a bank and so people started getting ideas together for peer to peer payments but the problem is, if I give you a five pound note, I don't have it anymore and you do. And unless I'm a really good counterfeiter, I can't spend it again. Okay. But if I email you a PDF of the five pound note, you can copy that multiple times and send it to all of your friends. So how do you secure digital money? And it wasn't until 2008 when somebody finally put the building blocks together and went, this is how we're going to do it. And the way they do it is they have a, a ledger just like you would in a bank or in a, a spreadsheet sort of thing. But anybody can post to that ledger. And in order for me not to go tell you what, I'll send you that money and then you confirm that I haven't and then we've both got the money. It's randomised. So people are chosen at random to confirm the transaction. So nobody knows anybody else. And the way that works is that there is a cryptographic puzzle to solve and it's done by processors, by computers. And when the cryptographic puzzle is solved, that computer gets the right to close off the block and start the next one. So you get this little line of blocks that have been closed and contain a bunch of transactions. And they go, right, these happened at this time and we, they're fine. 
And now we're moving on to the next block. And there's a reward for closing the blocks. And that's the mining. Ah. You get a reward in Bitcoin. So there's all these processors running 24 hours a day all around the world doing what they call what they call proof of work, which is confirming that all of these transactions, locking them into the block and saying, right, they, they, they exist now. And because it's a complicated transaction and because these things are happening on Bitcoin bo blockchain, it happens every 10 minutes. If you ever wanted to go back and change something, yeah, you could, but you'd have to change every single other block in the line. Uh, subsequently, because they all refer to each other, and it's okay, all okay. it's all underpinned on this this cryptography. So Bitcoin emerged, and and it was it, it was it was kind of exciting and kind of interesting. But the the thing that caught the attention of business was, well, actually, is it does it have to just be a coin? What else do we move between people? We move things in supply chains. We move houses and land and all sorts of stuff. And that was where it started getting interesting. So people started separating the blocks underneath, the idea of blocks underneath, and this ledger that anybody can participate in and turned it into a business application. So that's where the blockchain and what they call distributed ledgers came off. And then you also have the currencies, which, which keep going. So there are some currencies that are completely pure decentralized, like Bitcoin. Ethereum's decentralized as well, works on the same principle. And then there are others that are more closed. There are projects that have their own coins in. There are coins that just have a really specific function. There's one that converts currencies, sits underneath banking applications. If anyone's using Santander OnePay, whenever you send, uh, whenever you send a foreign currency transaction, it converts into this little cryptocurrency first and then back out again. So oh, it does really? it instantly. Yeah. So there's, yeah. so there's loads and loads of stuff happening. So from 2007, what we are, 11, 11, year, 11 and a half years now, nearly 12 years from the very first Bitcoin. And suddenly the technology has exploded across the world. People know about cryptocurrency. It's really starting to to to, to buzz, uh, and now central banks are looking at issuing their own cryptocurrency and all sorts of stuff. It, it's crazy. It really is. So I needed to speak to you about two years ago because you've just nailed it in ten minutes, and I, I think I've actually got that. I really do think I've got that. And no one's no one's left us as well. Not no one's like dove away from the live stream. <laughs> about. We've still got the same number, right? Which is great. Now let me take you to something you said which you said people can are now using this technology to do other stuff, like you mentioned, yeah. houses and, and supply chain. Let's drill into that a little bit. So are you saying that if we were to move houses, I don't have to give you cryptocurrency, we can actually just use the same tech to do the house? Yeah. The, ho the house is actually, that's a, a slightly odd one because that's one that hasn't yet fulfilled its potential. Okay. But the theory is that um, if you don't need somebody in the middle keeping all the records and you know, collecting all the details and posting them in the right places, then you could say, buy a house and that purchase automatically updates the register, the land register, without anybody mm. being in, intervening. So that's, that's, it, that actually works in the, in the Republic of Georgia, would you believe, has a working blockchain land registry. They were the first one to do it. Um, I, would be, I would believe that because some of these countries that, you know, you'd think it would be the States or Russia or UK or whatever, you think, oh, they're going to be the first ones to take this, China, or whatever. But actually, when you have technology, isn't it interesting how it's some people use it and they kind of go off on a tangent for it wasn't used for. And I'm thinking in my head, like Africa, you know, they use mobile phones quite a lot to, to yeah, yeah. currency around. Yeah, and, and so yeah. Yeah, and and I was obviously that wasn't thought about when when phones came out that people would do that, but then yeah. humans take technology and they, they twist it, and then we learn from that little twist, and then we go off on a tangent. So what you yeah. just said there is brilliant. So actually, what we're talking about with currency is you could actually start to attach land registry certifications yeah. and that sort of stuff to it. Yep, yeah. all sorts of stuff, all sorts of things like that. The supply chain one's really interesting as well. Um, uh, probably my there's loads of really good examples of of how blockchains being used in supply chain because what you're a, you, with a supply chain you you grow something and then you ship it and it goes to the wholesaler and then it goes off to the retailer and so on. So you 
you can't always see where that thing has gone and you can't always see where it's come from and you can't see what processes it's gone through. But if you treat the, the fruit or the, uh, or the, the, the raw material or the commodity or the, the, the part for your oil rig as a digital asset, if you're able to make it a digital asset reliably, then you can follow it all the way through the chain. And my absolute favourite one of those is durian fruit, that fabulously smelly fruit. There's a company in Singapore that started <laughs> to track durian fruit. From and a traceability the reason, point of view? From a traceability point of view, because it's a re it is the king of fruits in South If you've ever been to Southeast Asia, it is flipping everywhere, and 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 people love it. It's it's revolting. It doesn't. I, I don't mind that. I mean, I've I've eaten worse French cheeses, but the texture's just weird. But they, uh, so it's a really valuable thing. And what they were finding was that the the producers were getting a lot of insurance claims of all oh, this fruit is damaged, and they'd be like, no, the fruit was fine when it left here, but it was wiping out their profits. They, they, you know, they were really on the on the on the breadline because they they weren't able to to you know they weren't they weren't able to disprove insurance claims, and so what they done really simply was they photographed the fruit, and put it on a blockchain and said this fruit was fine when it left here, and then you trace that they they give it they give it its own little coin actually, which uh, in the trade we would call an NFT for many many reasons, but. Let's not go into those. And, they, and that little little coin moves through just like a Bitcoin would. And it goes to the wholesaler and then it goes to the retailer. And if somebody comes and goes, this fruit's rotten, they can go, no, it, it wasn't two days ago. Here's the picture. And that's trusted. And it's reduced the insurance claims and it's improved life for the people who are producing the fruit. But it's also given them an audit trail of what they're producing. And it means that people in the uh, who haven't been able to access trade finance are able to do it now because they've got some proof of their their activities. So there's some really really cool stuff coming out of it. This is the this is blowing my mind. This series has because of the use of this it's just going to be everywhere, isn't it? Everywhere, yeah. like do documents, you know, engineering drones that need revised uh, yep. version control. Yeah. Houses. If yep. you understand what Kate just said, can you give us a like, please? Right? <laughs> Because I am all over this now. I, like I say, I wish I'd saw you two years ago, Kate. So you just touched upon something there that you said about NFT. Now, we won't go down there, right? But what you said was us in the industry. So you're in this game now. What does that mean to Kate? What, what do you actually do? Um, I, work with, I work with different projects who are trying to work out how to solve problems and they happen to light on blockchain and say that, that that's the solution. So that's, I've, I've got, I've, I've been working with several. So I've been looking around at energy grids. So if I produce solar energy off the panels on my roof occasionally, right now, not very much, can I actually just sell that to my neighbor? Do I have to sell it to the grid? Can I just sell it to my neighbor? Right. That exists already. Brooklyn Microgrid was one of the first ones about three years ago. Uh, okay. there's, there's big projects in uh, Germany and all, all over the place. So that's an interesting one. Um, looking at, again, the very, very basic point in the supply chain. How do you prove things with different types of commodities? Because fruit's kind of easy, but what about other commodities? How would you do that with something that isn't easily traceable? I was talking to a guy in Australia a couple of weeks ago, um, and they use actually the same software to track their um, spaghetti squash. And I said to them, well, you know, they've, they've found it really successful. They've managed to, because they're able to give the consumer loads of information reliably about the, 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 the fruit, they, they've, they've actually made it a premium product. And I said, well, you know, are you thinking about doing it for any of your other products? And they said, well, yeah, it'd be great, but you can't put a label on a brassica. And I'm thinking, yeah, it's really, really hard to like stick a label on, a, on broccoli. So how do you, you know, how, how do you adapt to more complicated things. What else am I looking at? I mean, there's been a whole bunch of things that have been consulted around uh, using it for health data, um, around coins in, in ecosystems where maybe people aren't are, are relying on cash. So there's, there's all sorts of all sorts of projects that I can't talk that in that much detail about that are all looking at, looking at using blockchain to make things more transparent and enable people to trust the data that they're looking at. Do you know, as I love it when you said there, there's things you can't talk about because we are, we love all these little secret confidential <laughs> projects. 
share them out. There's only this only goes out to 100 countries, and it's we're going live across the world. It's fine. We'll keep it amongst ourselves. You, <laughs> you said something then, and what I'm thinking of is so I'm in the states. You're in China, Kate. I'm buying something off you in dollars. You're going to send me something. You're going to put it on a boat. It's going to come across. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to we might have different systems in our in our factories, ERP systems, for, for example. We're, we're talking stock and finance. And oh, loads of complications. Yeah. So we've got different systems. So this could be like a kind of centralized. Yeah, it's it, what you can what you can do, and what's already happening with some systems is actually overlaying uh, a blockchain layer, um, and so that you you actually simply ping up different transactions uh, as it goes along the supply chain. Um, so and there are lots of different jigsaw pieces as well. So if you're crossing the oceans, there's Musk have got a a, a big uh, blockchain platform called Trade Lens, which looks at, at shipping cargoes. And one of the earliest things actually was um, shipping insurance because it all comes down to what's the problem that you're solving. Um, and there was um, a company called XL Kaplan that's now part of AXA, AXA ASL, AXA XL. They were looking at the problem of having to insure shipping holes that were changing hands all the time. And what they did was they just reconciled a bunch of spreadsheets at the end of the year, which meant nobody quite knew what the premiums were and everything. And what they then decided to do was they they attached sensors in the the holes to know where they were and to understand when that when those assets changed hands so look you've got a transaction you've got an asset changing hands and, and they were able to track pretty much in real time what was going on with their holes and they were able to adjust premiums in real time but that also means that you know where all the holes are you know where all these cargo ships are and so all these bits of jigsaw, because that was that was the big key was we need to know where the damn things are so we can insure them on the day. And what they've got ultimately is a huge amount of extra data points that can be used to see where your cargo is. Do you, do you think this could drive down pricing? So this sounds like we're being much more efficient. There's, there's less people to get involved in the process in terms of managing and administering it. There's less stuff going missing in inverted commas, uh, uh, you know, during shipments yeah. and, and tracking and stuff. Could this have a possibility then to be so efficient and productive that it would drive down pricing? Um, I, I think so. Interestingly, the, um, the, the blockchain head at Renault Group in France, I, I chaired a panel um, at London Tech Week that she was on, and they've had 30% efficiency cost efficiencies from the way that they've, they've brought their data together and they're really seeing massive efficiencies in their supply chain as a result so you've got yes you're seeing cost savings already with people putting in proofs of concept you've also got the idea that actually the cost savings aren't just for the consumers and for the big guys they're for the producers as well so you've got yeah. benefits for the people at the very bottom so there's the obviously the durian fruit side of things you can see that benefit already coming through uh, i i have a, a friend who has a company agri ledger that's operating in haiti doing something quite similar with mango and they have i'm trying to remember it's a mind-bogglingly high multiple that they've they've improved the income of those of those people because of the the proof that's attached to these these fruit as it goes through and so it takes out an awful lot of the the, the problematic costs and it's delivering i think it is it 750 percent earnings now from previous the, the multi the multiples just bonkers so for every dollar they got before they get seven and a half now I can really imagine and I, I really hope that that goes through the supply chain and, and filters back down, you know, those cost savings from the top. Hopefully they do get to the to the crop producers, you know, the, the, the mango pickers or whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. I really hope it gets that far down. I would love to see. Yeah, it's starting to. Right, yeah, like price and really push down because, you know, yeah. over time, obviously everything just rises. So, yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. There's our Deb, look, she's excited to see you. She's been in meetings. Hi, Deb. <laughs> Uh, can I just put me up my misery, right? Kate, can I see the mug, please? Ah, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you, it sounds like you've got a few nerds on with us today. We've we've nerded out, right? But I'm 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 holding my own. I'm excited. I'm I'm loving this. Doing fantastically. <laughs> But why don't we then? Why don't we take it on a little bit of a tangent? Because you, you've, you've, you're an author, Kate. You've, you've got a few books, three or four books under your belt now. What you got? Uh, five as of tomorrow. Five. Ah, oh, ha, ha. 
Where's my special edition signed book on my desk here? Uh, I haven't got on. print copies yet. Have you not? <laughs> no. Are you excited? Are you really excited? Uh, I, I, I am. I am really yeah. excited. I have. I have all the others here. Let me see. Um, oh goodness me! Look at look at this bookshelf. Um, so well, this is the on, serious one. Get the, get the plugs out. Get the plugs out. All right. Let's get them that's in. the serious. That's the serious one. Where's my camera? There it is. So blockchain that hurricane. is blockchain hurricane: the origins, applications, and future of blockchain and cryptocurrency. So that's the serious one. That came out in March, and that's basically everything I knew about blockchain up until September last year. Uh, March in a really this, March of this year, this came out in March. Yes, it came out literally just before lockdown. So I've got fifty copies here that were supposed to go to South by Southwest and London Tech Week, oh, really, <laughs> and so on. So on my website, you can actually order them from me, and I will post them out with a lovely signature in the front. Um, nicely so, done. So that's nicely all cool. done. But uh, this is this is. I've been so bad with this because way back I was asked to write a cyber mm -hmm. security book. So a proper serious book around cyber risk and about three lunches and five coffees in the guy who asked me said, why don't you do it as fiction? And I said, don't be silly. I can't write fiction. Um, over the next eight months, he nagged me, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on, go on. And eventually I said, uh, okay, and I wrote 300 words and I sent it to him and he said, yeah, keep writing. Um, so I kept writing and 60,000 words later, I went, I'm, I'm done now. <laughs> it's, it finishes rather abruptly, but it ended up being a story. And it, this is, the key here is, I'm really embarrassed, but it was before everyone really knew about Bitcoin. And I played around with the idea that you could, you could um, damage people's confidence in normal currencies and in cryptocurrencies and you could manipulate the um the the, the prices to get okay. money so we had our criminals hacking everything and all the cyber security risks are in there and they're all real and all the tech is is real but extrapolated and my my connection still checks every single word i write so before bitcoin became really famous i wrote this and I called it Bitcoin Hurricane. And it sold really well in the cryptocurrency markets, but it's actually fiction. It's a thriller. And I accidentally left a body in the corridor at the end of it because I was bored and I just got rid of one of the characters. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I don't need to write about that one anymore. And it was starting to smell. So then I wrote this one. So that's the second one. So those, those came out in 2017, 2018. And then so I Bitcoin Hurricane. And that and one or a, or, a, so, or a two? Yeah, and I've written the third one now. So the third one is called Tangled Fortunes, and it comes out tomorrow. So the body in the corridor was addressed in the second book? It was. And the fallout from the body in the corridor is addressed in the third. So, yeah, it's it's, it's a trilogy. It's, it's quite a nice trilogy arc, but I've got the fourth one in my head now, so I need to map out the next trilogy, I think. But they're, so, they're getting a good following <laughs> You, you mentioned there that you, you brought out Blockchain Hurricane, was it, in March? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and yes. then you would just thrown another book out tomorrow. Yes. How, how, do you do, how, do you, how do you write so many words? Do you, do you take yourself <laughs> off to an island? Like, like I, I, I interviewed Anne Cleves, who wrote the Vera books last year, and Anne, <sighs> Anne also, also wrote, wrote the book Shetland, and she, Anne actually takes herself off to the Shetland Isles and to write away from everything and takes us off on a bit of sabbatical. Tony Robinson, uh, we had on a couple weeks ago, yeah. he does the same. He goes off to Malta and he writes his books. You've got two children, Kate. You've got a business to run. How on earth are you writing multiple books? Okay. I would I would have said, no, I just do it with everybody around me. But actually, quite honestly, the Blockch Blockchain Hurricane, so the nonfiction book, I actually wrote a huge amount of that in Premier Inn Hubs around the country so i'd be going to, i'd go to london for a meeting and i'd because i'd go down on the, the 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 first evening and then i'd have the full day and then i'd come back the second day i'd stay in my little nest in the hub 
because those, those, those tiny little capsule hotels. And I'd sit there in my little nest with a glass of wine or a lot of coffee and I'd write and I would bang through, you know, six, seven thousand words in a stay in one of those little hotels because I could absolutely concentrate and I'd do it between meetings. And sometimes I was interviewing people for the next bit of the book as well. So that, that was right. that was kind of cool. And when I'm writing when I'm writing fiction, I, I, I sit in the middle of the house with my laptop. And as I get closer and closer to deadline, I write faster and faster. <laughs> does, the quality, does the quality deteriorate at the end? <laughs> um, oh, yeah, my editor comes and goes, do you realise that in that chapter they're, in, they're, they're being swept through the, the Wyoming night in a car and then suddenly they're in the hotel and you're like, Oh yeah, and she's like, "Can you can you at least get them from one place to another?" I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, so you mentioned there about Wyoming. Then, so does that mean that you've got to um, pull some of your experiences about your travels, or do you? Yeah, go and, very much. Yeah, very much. okay. So you don't you yeah. don't you don't say right. I'm going to have to head off to Wyoming just for a bit of research. No, no, I'd already been to Wyoming. <laughs> right. <laughs> No, um, so the, the, the first book set in London and it, it, it just, just ease. It, uh, it worked well because it was round banks. So I had a, a bank in the middle of the, the story and it's all in London, uh, and in a village that is very close to my heart, um, in the, in the, the south where I, where I grew up. Um, but unnamed. So people have to guess where it is. Uh, <laughs> and, then the second one I started to introduce actually, uh, some characters from Singapore, uh, because I already had quite a, a, a diverse bunch of characters. And the third one, I have actually pretty much set on the Northeast coast. Ah, right. I have. So uh, a lot of the, some of the action takes place in Singapore. Some of the action takes place in Wyoming and the, the, the bulk of the, the bulk of the action takes place in a sort of Slightly rose tinted hybrid northeast coast, which has got lovely diving, a nuclear power station, a landfill site, and a big beach. <laughs> so it's kind of a cross between Seton Carew, wow. Hartlepool, um, and, and probably up towards Seam, actually. Um, yeah, keep your, don't get your nuclear energy anywhere near South Shields, please. Keep that up there. Keep uh, that uh, coastline here. Yeah, I, I haven't gone. I haven't gone. No, we'll, we'll keep the nuclear power station. We like our nu nuclear power station. I'm only three miles away from it. So. <laughs> Who, who's the, uh, is there, is there um, like a, a, a star? Is there like a, what's the person's name? Is there like a main character? Cameron. Cameron Silvera is the head of the Argentum Associates um cyber security team and so there's a there's a there's a really there's a really good little team there's eight of them actually it's it's quite complicated keeping track of eight people and all of the baddies as well and i've got a particularly nice villain coming through now so i'm really pleased with that and i've got another villain that's about to because there's a couple of people that have been reading it in a in an odd sense actually we've got, we're going to come full circle in a second uh, and they really really liked one of the characters in the second book which i had jailed at the end so i'm going to have to set the fourth one a little bit further ahead so that i can spring that character and bring them back ah right okay so you have to do a little bit because, of time before you can get them out yeah so yeah oh, oh it was a very bad character very 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 misbehaved terribly you know when you're writing characters you mentioned there was a team of eight so have you got a little dossier on each one like a little avatar so you know that person and their children and their interests and i've got a super scribbly notebook somewhere which have i can't you? lay my on right now yeah massive great you know so what's happening to noah you know what what what's what's going on in her life yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, the only thing that I, I never write down and I have to go back and read them is to check what, what kind of coffee they order. Because I always, <laughs> always forget. Always forget. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. no, they're, they're, they're coming along. I've, I've really, really enjoyed the process. I had no idea how to write fiction. But one of the really interesting things, and I'm, gonna, I'm coming, kind of coming back, so I have had the question asked as to whether, you know, it might be ad adaptable. And it's really nice to have that question asked and I don't know if it'll go anywhere. But one of the problems is that when you're dealing with sort of the cybersecurity community and, and you're thinking about people typing, and when I was writing it, people always typed, didn't we? We did voice mm -hmm. and we did email. And then suddenly we get COVID and immediately you've got video. So the third book really focuses far more on video and how that would work, because one thing, it makes it more visual just in case the question continues to be asked. And two, that's what we're used to now. And it's been such a big jump, such a big jump. It really has. What do you mean by video then? Like in the book or are we talking? In the book, yeah, no. 
Oh, right. oh no, no, for the for the for the for the the fiction. So oh, what I've been okay. writing. So when people have been talking before, they've been typing in communities and chat rooms, and suddenly oh. I've got them in in rooms where even they may be they may be disguised with avatars and so on, but it's more face to face because that's what we're now used to. And if I I'd see. put that earlier, I it, nobody would have believed. It. So are you gonna like are you gonna timestamp these books and like refer to COVID then, or are you just gonna take that concept of using more video technology, but you're not gonna say. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just putting more video technology in it. That's yeah, all. I'm not even yeah. mentioning it. Oddly, in the second book, I did have a backstory of a pandemic round about the early 2020s. Oh, so you are Oops. just... Well, I'm really sorry. sorry. It's, you, it's you and then it's, you, it's on you. It's on you. Wow. Fantastic stuff. So um, I was going to ask anybody if I had any questions for you because um, I think we're coming to the end. Is there anything that we haven't touched upon that, that you'd like to share, Kate? Oh... Goodness me, question, to put me on the, put me on the spot. Is there anything you would like to have shared that I didn't ask you? I can't be a master of all these things. I don't know what's going on in your brain. Nobody does. It's got that much rattling on in there. <laughs> I know. I get the, 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 the sci-fi bit of it just comes out of me being really excited about emerging technologies. And I think that the, the big thing is that you... We, we look at all these new things coming through, like blockchain and the, and the rise of artificial intelligence and the way that it's permeating things. And and we think, crikey, this is all new. This is all space age. And then you go back 10 years and you go, 10 years ago, we didn't have as much online video. We didn't have this kind of conferencing. We didn't have, um, you know, people were just, just starting to use e-books, for goodness sake. We didn't have location services. And we take all of that for granted. So don't, I'd, I'd say to people, don't assume that these things aren't coming quickly. They're going yeah. to be in your lives before you know about it. So get informed about it. Um, and if you do that through fiction, that's really cool with me. Amazon, Kate Walsh, just saying. Um, <laughs> if you do it through fact, that's also very cool with me. Amazon, Kate Walsh, <laughs> <laughs> But you'd rather come to you directly so you could sign in? And yeah, I've got, um, I, I have copies of Blockchain Hurricane, the, the, the non-fiction book around blockchain, which obviously is a brilliant read because I write fiction, so it's a story. Um, and I have some copies of Hacked Future as well. I'm actually out of, I've got my last copy of Bitcoin Hurricane and I'm hanging on to it before I print to get some more printed. Uh, but you can get paperback on online. And if you bump into me, I will then sign it. <laughs> Just, someone's going to have to wander around with a copy of your book for the next year, hoping to bump in with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll never see you anymore. We can't even network. It's so bad. I know. I tell, you what, I tell you what it is, it's interesting because what you're saying is that these technologies are adapting really fast. Even yeah. stuff like what we're doing now, this software we're using, there's new functionality, there's new tweaks coming constantly. And and it's it's as if it's being kind of pushed on us, forced on us, and now but we're all we're all adopting it so well. Yeah. And even even people who've been kind of digitally excluded in the past are not people who haven't been who've been a bit hesitant to using digital are becoming now the new yeah. normal for want of a yeah. better phrase. I love that. I'm loving that though. I have to say that if there's one really good thing that I hope comes out of this as a long tail is yes, we're all using it, but when we say all, we mean all of the people who are able to connect. And yes. what really is a big challenge is the people who are genuinely excluded because even though we've got all of this they can't get online and if anything comes out of covid i mean yes familiarity but absolutely getting everyone connected because if you're not connected up properly you are going to miss out on everything that's coming through and so if there's any way that our industries can help to bring people on board and improve people's access crikey we've, we've got to do it I've seen that even the last last year or so. Kate, I sit on the board of a housing association, and in our housing plus schemes, where we've got well, all the people, we've got technology in there, you know, that they can access um, to speak and, and FaceTime their friends and family because they can't get in there. Even mobile phones now, you know, if you don't have a mobile phone, you might be able to get certain benefits, universal yep. credit, and things that you need phones. So we're trying to put funds in place to do that. So yeah, you know, I do see some funds being pushed into, you know, getting rid of that digital exclusion bit, which is just got amazing. To. It's, it's brilliant. Got to. Yeah. Well, Keith, I don't <laughs> envy producer Misha writing up these show notes because we've been <laughs> everywhere, everywhere. Mangoes and blockchain. Oh, man. <laughs> And it's been, it's been too long because we've been speaking about doing this for a long time. Oh, God, it's been years. Yes. Mm. So thank you so much. And I'm glad we waited years because 
we've managed to talk about all the new things that you've done, which has been yeah. remarkable. I was, I'm, I'm, I'm so envious that you managed to bash out all these books. <laughs> I think I need to lock myself in a premiere in, don't I? Uh, I highly recommend it. <laughs> Actually, I did take myself off two weeks ago when I was in a week. Uh, I was in a hotel all weekend trying to complete a tender. I was in there uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Didn't leave. So <laughs> I can believe I was it. I isolating. Right, Mrs. Thank you so much. Love oh, you thanks, for Ian. Join us, and we'll be pushing this out as a podcast episode. I think today, I think we're gonna get this out today because it's Woo. amazing, <laughs> outstanding. <laughs> So then, I hope to see you very soon. Um, yes, in real life. For, in real life, in real life. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick you out in true style, okay? This is what we do. I'm going to punch you out if you don't mind. So, Kate, it's been lovely. How cool was that? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed that too. I, I thought it was a, I held my own. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I understood it. That's obviously Kate's skill, though, isn't it? Uh, thanks again so much for joining us. Friday morning, 10 o'clock. How was that time for you? I, I think that was pretty cool. Kate was quite laid back with it being a Friday. I felt the same. We're on, you know, getting excited for the weekend. We've tested this a few times in terms of different times and days, but I like a Friday morning, to be honest. I think that works works well. Thanks so much, Deb, for you to join us today. And I'm loving your pink get up. I saw that on Facebook the other day. Is that for breast cancer awareness? I think it might be, might it? Um, well done. I'm sure I saw you dancing in the rain as well. So well done, girls, for raising money for that particular charity. Great stuff. And there's been a lot of charity work happening, which is great because I've said this a few times on this show. Charities really need our help right now because there's lots of events not taking place. So now is the time to help our charities and, of course, food banks as well. So, you know, if you can, a few of your friends put some food together, that's amazing. So... I wish you a great weekend. Dawn, Dawn, lovely to see you. I uh, wish you a great weekend. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, this has been the Industry Angel. And thanks for listening.